So our next talk is uh, really a tutorial, Practical Software Radio, by Matt Edis, founder and president of Edis Research. So we're really excited to have this particular talk. It, Matt first gave it at the very first GRCon in Philadelphia in 2011. Uh, and we got him to give it again, and it's one of our favorites. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as Ben said, the first time I gave this uh, tutorial, it was at uh, the original GRCon, where we were 50 of us were crowded into a very small um, classroom at uh, University of Pennsylvania. So um, it's really great to see how much this has grown in the uh, in the five years since then. Um, and uh, the original time, the the first time I gave this, it was a four-hour thing, and now we've got 45 minutes. So. Uh, it is much, much abridged, and um, all of the source code and everything for the demos and the interactive stuff is available online, and the slides are online. Um, so I'm just going to give sort of a whirlwind tour of this. But um, the basic idea was um, people uh, are not, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, there's a lot of practical knowledge that, uh, about software radio and about digital radios in general that is not really well uh, taught. And, uh, and I, so my goal was to help everybody develop an intuition for how their radios are working and an ability to look at uh, spectrum displays or IQ diagrams and diagnose what's going on there. And that, that's really the goal. So you can better understand and gain more insight into the systems. So the basic concepts, um, the, the basic things I'm going to go over, just some, some basic things about measurements that I, that I find are not as um, uh, uh, um, well uh, uh, known as they should be. Um, a little bit about radio architectures and then impairments and what, um, what uh, signals look like um, after they pass through real radios. So um, this, uh, I, I, I really like this quote. I think it uh, sums up a lot. Um, I'm going to be giving a lot of, uh, showing some models today for um, signals and, uh, and how radios uh, treat them. Um, none of, uh, nothing is really truly exact in these, um, but they are very good models for, um, for what you can expect to see, and hopefully they will uh, in improve your insight into radios. So we're going to talk about making measurements, radio architectures, and uh, signal impairments. So first, some measurements. Um, I find there's a lot of confusion about noise floor, bandwidth, um, uh, how do you measure power, uh, and, and how do you use FFT displays. Um, they're somewhat different from conventional swept spectrum analyzers and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and as well, um, I, I think the, probably the most widely misunderstood concept is, is uh, dynamic range. Uh, partially because everybody has their own definition of, uh, of what that is. So um, first I'm going to bring up uh, my first GR uh, display here. So this is a pretty basic application. Um, and it is a, uh, where we've got a sine wave and we've got some noise and we're looking at the spectrum of that. Now um, if we look at the peak of this in, in the display, it's at about minus 9 dB. And if we look at the, I'll turn up the averaging here. And if we look at the noise level, it's about minus 39 dB for a difference of 30 dB. So can, uh, can anybody tell me what the SNR of this signal is? Everybody's quiet, good, because you know it's a trick question, but yes. Uh, so, so in actuality, uh, well, so the answer that most people give is the, the signal to noise ratio is 30 dB because they see a tone that's 30 dB above this level of noise. The actual answer, which we'll, which we'll see when I um, turn on the, the um, GNU radio flow graph stuff to measure it. So I'll turn on the, the number sinks that um, tell us the power and the SNR. We'll run this and we can see that actually noise power is one, signal power is one, the SNR is zero. And the reason is that the signal uh, is, is all concentrated in one bin of the FFT in this case, and the noise is spread across, in this case, a thousand bins of the FFT. So the noise power, uh, the total noise is actually the noise in every bin put together, and that's what you would see in the time domain. 
And if I click over to the time domain, you'll see something that much more uh, logically re resembles a, um, a zero dB SNR, right? But when you look at it in the, in the FFT, it has filtered a lot. And, and the reason you can't just say, uh, um, you know, oh, I have a, a 30 dB difference between the peak and the, and the noise floor uh, is that you don't have the next piece of information, which is how many bins are in the FFT. There are 1,000 bins. 10 log of 1,000 is 30. So you add 30 to the noise level, and that, uh, so then your, your signal being 30, be, uh, 30 above the noise floor, but the noise, total noise is 30 dB more than that, gives you this 0 dB SNR, which you see down here. And if you look at the, the GNU radio graph, you can see how we generate this, a signal source, a noise source, we add it, we also met, use some RMS blocks to measure it, and divide it, and to send it to the number sinks. So that's, that just gives you an idea of, um, of uh, uh, you know, how, how we measure signals and, and, that, and the like. So now I'm going to attempt to zoom in here. It's not as easy on, on the QT GUI, um, but uh, let's see. If I do it. Anyway, um, so what I was going to do is show uh, the concept of scalloping loss, but I, I'm it's, it may be a little hard to see on this scale because uh, I'm having trouble zooming in. But uh, I'll, I'll turn up the averaging. That, that may help us a little bit. OK. So now what you see is I, I actually tuned this sine wave to be exactly in one bin of the FFT. We're using a rectangular window. So um, anything that's dead on in the bin will always show the full, its full power. But um, when, when the signal's frequency gets offset a little bit, actually, I maybe I need to turn down the averaging to see it better. But a, as the signal's frequency moves from one bin to the next, it actually it will drop on the display. And you see it drops. It's hard to tell, but it's dropping about 3 dB. And that's what is referred to as scalloping loss. So if your signal is not exactly in a bin, it will show a lower amplitude, and, but the power will be shown in multiple bins. So when you buy a, uh, a spectrum analyzer, the, uh, well, the old school spectrum analyzers that swept wouldn't, wouldn't show that effect. They would always show the peak power of your signal. The newer modern spectrum analyzers that are based on FFTs, what they actually do is they, they, they cheat and they fudge the display. They don't show up an F, just show an FFT, they look at a few bins next to it and they say, oh, all of this power was really from the signal in the peak and draw the peak taller. So you don't notice the scalloping loss. But it's actually hiding the reality of the signal from you. So um, again, this is just useful in, in learning to uh, interpret your, uh, your display. Does everybody follow what I was saying there? OK, so now one of the other, um, some of the other factors that go into uh, interpreting an FFT display uh, is your window. So I was showing that with the no, no window or the square uh, uh, window or box car, which basically is, is no weighting. Um, then most of the time when you're doing an FFT, if you're doing an FFT for something like OFDM, that's what you use. But if you're doing an FFT for spectral analysis and to gain insight into your signal, typically you'll apply a window. And there's, there's a couple of choices that have varying um, uh, pros and cons in different applications. Uh, and, uh, but one that's interesting for this that shows no scalloping loss is called the flat top window. And so I'm going to switch that over to the flat top window. And you'll see a, uh, a constant um, non, no scalloping loss signal. Uh, if I can, here it is. Uh, flat top's not shown. OK. In any case, the, uh, the advantage of the flat top is that there, it shows no scalloping loss. The way it does this is it actually spreads the power evenly. So all signals will look weaker, but they'll appear flat across the band. So as you move across, any, any tone will actually look like it's in five or six consecutive bins at an equal level. And so you end up with a flat top in the frequency spectrum. Uh, as opposed to a flat top in the time domain, which is the rectangular window. So it's easy to get those confused. Um, that one's not used terribly often, but it is useful when you can't control where the signal falls between bins and you want to take a direct measurement of power off of the display. Um, OK, so the, can, can somebody cut down the echo on, on this? It's, it's 
just a little bit distracting. Thank you. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show is the, um, well, so we talked about SNR and, uh, and noise floor and, uh, and how it's misunderstood. The next is sensitivity. So we get this question a lot. Obviously, we make um, USRPs and, and daughter boards and things, and, and um, we're, we're very often given the question, what is the sensitivity of this device? And um, unfortunately, sensitivity is a poorly defined term, and so we can't just give an answer. Um, sensitivity is really only defined if you have defined what type of signal and what bandwidth and what uh, um, performance level, what error rate, that kind of thing. And in that case, then you can give a, a, a sensitivity. So for example, uh, 802.11 is specced at sensitivity being a, um, uh, at, at a BPSK with a uh, 1 in 1,000 error rate, at what, how, much in, how much input power is necessary for that. That's the sensitivity uh, um, spec for, uh, for Wi-Fi. But, uh, and TV has a different way of measuring sensitivity, and, and LTE has a different way. So we can't give one answer for sensitivity. So, so what we spec instead is noise figure, which is the only universal um, uh, measurement of the noise characteristics of the system for weak signals. And then noise figure just tells you how much noise above the ambient noise your, your receiver would create. And then from there, you can, with any other information, compute the sensitivity or the performance for your particular signal. Um, and then, of course, uh, dynamic range is another one. Every, uh, we get people asking a lot, what, what's the dynamic range of your radios? And, um, and unfortunately, again, it's not, there's not one answer. There's many definitions of dynamic range. Um, one, one that's useful is the spur-free dynamic range, although that's typically uh, just of an, uh, really an A to D converter specification or a D to A converter, but you can extend it to, to the radio itself. And so what that says is, let's say you have 100 dB SF, uh, SFDR, it means that when you have a, a maximum scale signal at 100, uh, um, uh, a, a, sorry, a maximum scale signal, that the worst spurs will be 100 dB below that. Um, now, 100 dB is, it would be a good number for, um, for an A to D converter, but um, most, very few radios will actually achieve that. The uh, analog front end will limit you to something significantly less. Um, and then there's other, other factors like IP3 and power handling and gain control range. And um, I use the example, I once saw an article, this, this uh, uh, designer claimed to have uh, created a, uh, a, um, a radio with a 200 dB dynamic range. And, and what it was, was he had a, a radio with, really had an, about an 80 dB dynamic range based on his metric, and then he had a 120 dB variable attenuator in front of it. And so, so yeah, so any, anyone can um, sort, of, sort of play with those numbers, and, uh, but we, we try to give very um, uh, straightforward universal figures of merit. So when, when someone asks us about dynamic range or sensitivity, we answer in terms of noise figure and uh, IP3. And, and IP3 is sort of the dynamic uh, behavior of the radio in, in the presence of strong signals. And, uh, and so I'll, I'm going to get a little bit more into IP3 and, uh, and dynamic range in a little bit. Um, one other uh, misconception that we run into a lot is, uh, is around quantization. So um, one, one um, not necessarily question, but one, uh, one thing we hear a lot with our radios is someone will, will, will ask, OK, how much gain does this have? How much AGC does it have? And then they'll, they'll do some, and, and, they, and how many bits are in the A to D converter? And they'll do some math and come up with, oh, the, the one LSB of the A to D converter is this amplitude of signal. And so I can't see any signal weaker than that. And, um, and, and that is sort of a, a, a fundamental misunderstanding of how, how, how radios work. And, and, it, 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 and, and that, you, you actually see that in a lot of radio designs because people will put way too much gain in so they can, because they'll say, okay, I need to receive a signal of minus 120 dBm. I need to make sure that that is at least two or three bits worth of my A to D converter. And they put in too much gain in the system and then you run into IP3 problems. And so, um, so I wanted to go into a little more detail on quantization, what it means, how it affects you, and, and how, to, um, how, uh, how, how to interpret the number of bits on your A to D converter and things like that. So at the top is the, is the basic graph, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, that shows how quantization works. You have some analog input, and then the output takes stepped values. Now, in, in reality, it's a little, you know, 
sometimes there's miscodes and things, and there's, there's uh, noise on this and nonlinearity, but this is the basic concept. Um, and so this is uh, uh, quantization in the amplitude uh, um, as opposed to discretization, which is in the time domain. Uh, both happen in an A to D converter, but here I'm mostly talking about the, the amplitude uh, uh, um, steps and not the time steps. So, um, and why do we care about this? Well, A to D converters do not have infinite precision. These days you are starting to see some 16-bit RF A to D converters, but even those have, um, have finite uh, precision. And so, uh, and, and of course even floating point numbers are quantized. So um, the, the standard numbers that you'll see is that SNR is equal to 6.02 you know, times the number of bits. And, and that, that, that works uh, reasonably well. The, the assumption is you have a nearly full scale signal in and its signal to noise ratio will be um, uh, 6.02 times the number of bits. Um, uh, uh, in, in reality, your, your A to D will not do this well um, because there'll be noise on top of that and there'll be other factors. But, but that's um, certainly if you quantize you know, in the computer, if you go from a float to this, that, that number is a reasonable approximation. So, um, so I'm going to show another flow graph, this one about quantization. And so this is pretty straightforward. We have a noise source going through a bandpass filter, and we have a signal source, which is a sine wave. I add them together, they get throttled, and then we go through a quantizer, and I have uh, control to control the quantization. And then we have a, a, an FFT display, of the, of the output of that quantized signal and a, a histogram of the, of the um, levels. So here we have, um, this is the histogram here. You'll see everything is just coming through as zero. Um, it's currently set to eight bits, although you can't read that here for some reason on the QT. And um, the signal amplitude is very low, and it's too low, so it's not toggling a bit. So it's at minus 150 dBc, uh, dBfs. So dBfs means how many decibels is the signal power below a full-scale A to D converter signal? So I'm going to increase it, and you'll see. Now, you, we know this is an 8-bit A to D, so 8 times 6 is 48. So around minus 50, we should start seeing something, um, uh, something start to toggle there. So when we get to about minus 50, we start to see it toggle. And here, uh, you can see, you can see the, the signal, but it, there's a, uh, obviously a lot of spurious down there. Now, uh, and you can see it's toggling plus or minus one bit. Now, I, I said before that we shouldn't interpret the A to D converter level as uh, the, the smallest signal that we can see. But in, in this display, it would be. And the reason is because there's no noise. In any real system, in any real radio, there will be noise. And so I'm going to add in some noise. The, all those go away. And those spurs are now spread out, and you don't see them. Now, that, that actually happens e to an even greater extent in real A to D converters, which have their own nonlinearities. But even without that, even in just a digital exact simulation of a perfect A to D, you can see that noise, noise has this, this uh, purpose of cleaning up your signal. Now, uh, now this is the 14-bit, um, but as you uh, reduce the number of bits, let's go to the 10-bit, right? You, you see the, the, the floor come up. and we would drop down to a, a, an 8-bit, it's, it's, well, in this case, it's not even strong enough to toggle. So we would have to turn up the signal amplitude a bit. Um, and so that is wh why more bits are better. So even though the number of bits does not really affect your minimum uh, viewable signal, it does affect the cleanliness and the number of spurs. And uh, that's why the, you know, the better radios will have more and more bits, 14 bits uh, in an A to D, for example. Okay, so um, were there any other questions on that? Okay, so feel free to throw questions out there anytime. Uh, everybody's being quiet, so I'm not sure if you're like, oh, this is obvious and boring or, or, or com you know, completely like nuts and, and you're not following me or somewhere in between. So, um, okay, good. So now I'm going to talk about dynamic range. And uh, so when we get to Dynamic range, we'll, we talk about nonlinearity, and, and this, this, is being, this is really the dominant issue in, um, in uh, strong signal environments, and that, that's really why we care about this. So uh, real transistors and real components all have a maximum signal that they can accommodate, and they become less and less linear as they get stronger and stronger, stronger, and stronger signals coming in. Um, 
And so that's why we have AGC. So you don't, you know, it, it, when you have your maximum gain, you are, um, you're, you would be clipping with a strong signal. So you reduce your gain so that you're not clipping and, and you let uh, the correct signal amplitude in at the expense of, um, at, at the expense of the noise uh, floor. So this is modeled very often by this um, uh, uh, power series expansion. And if you're more complicated about it, it's a Volterra expansion in, um, if, if you have memory effects and things like that. But basically, there's, there's your first order, the K1, which is what you want. This would be your signal's gain, uh, the, the device's gain. Then you have a second order, a third order, and then there would be many more orders. The, the higher the order, the, the less dominant it is at low signal levels. So mostly, we care about the third order. Now, why don't we usually don't care that much about second order? So why is that? Well, so the, 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 the location of the interference is determined by the order. So a second order interferer, it will occur at double frequency or close to DC. And so in many radios, that, that would be outside the filters. Now, in a direct conversion radio, radio you do care about that. And, and we, we, if we have time, we'll get into that. But in all radios, third order is in band. Because if you have two signals, the third order interference will be right near your signal. And so third order is usually what people talk about with dynamic range. And if you, you do the math, um, you, you, you find out that the, you know, these V cubes ends up giving you third harmonics, but also in band signals. So it's typically the most important. So I'm going to show another graph um, with this is with a two-tone test. And uh, this is simulating a radio. So right now, there's an effectively perfect um, IP3. We've got two signals. And as we, as we turn, change the, um, uh, the IP3 uh, factor from 0 and we increase it, you can see it, it creates these, these sum and difference products. Now, it also creates third harmonic stuff that's off the screen. They typically don't care about those. You care about these because they fall in band. And so, so a, as that K factor changes, you change the level of the signals. So this is why we talk about back off in signals. So th these two signals are very near full scale here. If I reduce their amplitude, um, if I can uh, find that amplitude, here we go. So th if we, we reduce it, at, you can see as we reduce it, if I reduce it by 1 dB, the tones fall down at a rate of 3 dB. And that's, then that's how you can tell it's third order distortion. Now, when you're looking at a display on a screen, you have a tone that you don't understand. If you reduce the signals you do know by 1 dB and that moves by 3 dB, you know that's third order distortion. That is a very useful tool for uh, debugging your, your radios. It, when you have a spur and, and uh, trying to find what, what its cause is, uh, uh, is important. Now, um, so that, that's IP3. I'm going to turn that back uh, off. And then we have IP2 which in a direct conversion radi radio, you'll see it does not fall in band, but it cl falls close to the DC, right? Because you have the sum of these comes here, uh, double this, sorry, sum of these comes to this tone, the uh, double this one is here, double this one is there, and then they also go to the difference frequencies, which is around zero, and then the difference of each with their cells is DC. And so now in a direct conversion radio, you're trying to capture this whole bandwidth, so you actually do care about second order um, uh, uh, distortion in a direct conversion radio. Uh, you also care about in things like cable modems where you're operating with more than one octave of bandwidth and a signal and you would see its second harmonic at the same time. Um, but a super hat, you will never see anybody quote second order uh, because it would be you know, effectively infinite. Um, so, so again, you'll see here now everything falls at a rate of 2 to 1 instead of, um, instead of 3 to 1. And I'll change the amplitude. And you'll see those drop faster than the main signal, but they don't drop as fast as the third, harm, uh, the third order distortion would. OK. I'm uh, running a little bit short on time, so I'll just show a couple of other effects that you would expect to see in a real radio. So here we see um, IQ imbalance. And so what, uh, the reason for that is uh, we have a magnitude uh, imbalance. And le let me create some magnitude imbalance. And the worse the magnitude imbalance, the more you see those signals. Now, so why, so um, the, the correction is correcting it. So, <laughs> um, so why, why do we see that? Well, we, here we have an, uh, the gain on the I channel and the gain on the Q channel is, is imbalanced. And so that results in these other tones showing up. Now, in, in USERPs, we have corrections for these 
to, to reduce them. On some of the devices, the ones with the integrated RF transceiver, the, that device does it itself and, and basically corrects this out, actually in a way very similar to the algorithm I have here that's making it disappear. Um, and in, um, in our uh, uh, discrete uh, radio designs, we do it all digitally uh, in the FPGA. So that, that is a magnitude balance. There's also a phase imbalance, which um, really has the same effect. And looking at it, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, and, uh, but there's no phase correction running right now, so that doesn't decrease over time. But um, so here's, here's an effect. So I'm turning off the phase imbalance. We've still got the magnitude imbalance, right? But I'll turn that off too. So now we have no imbalance, and we, but we still see the imbalance tones. The reason is the magnitude imbalance has a very slow update rate, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's set to the, to the old thing. So if I speed this up, it'll go away, right? Oops. So there it's gone. Now, yeah, um, so the, that update rate is, is, a, is a parameter that you trade off. The, the faster you make it, the quicker it, it can respond to changes in IQ balance. But the faster you make it, the more it responds to noise. And in fact, so right now, there's no actual imbalance. But if I make the imbalance correction too fast, it will actually create its own imbalance. And you can see some tones down there that are forming. And, and you can see those. Those are actually being created by the imbalance algorithm being imperfect. So, uh, so there's a, a, a range over which the, the bandwidths of those corrections are, are useful. Let's see, what else? Um, okay, the next thing I was gonna show was, uh, well, let's, let's move on to the, how does this make, affect a real signal? So let's look at an OFDM signal. And so here we generate an OFDM signal, we send it through this radio impairments model block, which has all of these impairments in it, and it comes out to a constellation sync. So we'll run that. So there's our QAM 16 uh, OFDM signal, right? Now you can't tell it's OFDM just from looking at this because it, uh, just a plain old QAM 16 will look the same. But we, we know from the flow graph that this was a, 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 an OFDM. So, so um, what would phase noise look like on this signal? Okay, so phase noise, uh, if this was plain old QAM 64 or QAM 16, Phase noise would just cause a rotation of those dots. And you would see them look like rotating like this, but you would see no, no amplitude noise. Now this is, but this is OFDM, and so while each individual signal is rotated like this, it also causes them to bleed into their neighbors because there's so many next to each other. And the bleed into their neighbors is random. So we actually see it looking like random noise, even though it's phase noise. Now, that, so that takes away one tool that you had in single carrier systems. If you saw your rotation doing this, you know that's phase noise. But in an OFDM signal, it's hard to make, it's hard to do that. And so, and so that take, in OFDM, a lot of the impairments all look the same. And so it makes it a little harder to diagnose them from a constellation. And so if you go down to one tone, you have a better luck, uh, better luck at diagnosing the impairments. So in any case, this looks like Gaussian noise, even though it's phase noise. Now, one way you can tell it's phase noise, so, sorry, the, the wider phase noise, because we know phase noise has a spectrum, the wider phase noise is causing the tones to bleed into their neighbor, and that's causing the size of these to be more than a dot, right? It looks like Gaussian noise. But the whole constellation rotating, that's the low speed phase noise. So if you see your, if you have OFDM and you see the whole constellation rotating back and forth, that, that's, that's close in phase noise. And that often can be fixed with your, um, your synchronization. And it doesn't necessarily need to be fixed. In some cases, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, um, fixed through improving the actual phase noise of the signal. And that's, that's one of the reasons OFDM is a little more tolerant to close-in phase noise. So now, um, now I'm going to turn the phase noise back off. And um, uh, there's a little delay in the signal here. Oh, oh, no, I turned it too much. There we go. That's off. <laughs> um, now, IP3, normally, in, in, a, in a single carrier signal, would, IP3 is, a, is sort of like soft clipping. So it would crush in the constellation here, which normally I, I would show if we had the full, full time. But here, if we, if we make the IP3 worse, we can see, again, it looks just like Gaussian noise again. So why is that? Well, 
individually, it, so first, in the time domain, this is no longer one constellation. It's, it's now a noise-like signal itself. So any clipping actually looks like impulse noise for the whole signal, and that impulse noise spreads across all the bins. So every, every single tone's uh, 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 intermod is going on to the other tones nearby. And so, um, so IP3 also looks like galaxy noise. Again, it makes it harder to diagnose your signal, and so it's often helpful to go back to single tones to, to, to do that. Um, and, and you'll probably guess uh, IP2 also has a similar effect um, in, in that it, it looks like Gaussian noise. Um, now, this is one reason, uh, or, or actually I'll, I'll go to, now, can anybody guess what um, phase imbalance, or, or let's do magnitude, IQ magnitude imbalance looks like? Guesses? Okay, so the guess, you, you should be guessing it, may, it looks like um, Gaussian noise, but actually it doesn't. And, and that's only because this is a simulation. I'll explain why. What's happening here, IQ imbalance causes what's on one side of the spectrum to be mirrored onto the other. Now, in, or, uh, in this case, that means one tone which ha is mirrored onto another tone which has the same shape at a weaker value. So as I move this, it, you'll see that happen. Now, you will never see a, a constellation that actually looks like this, and the reason is, one, it would be obscured by the other factors of noise. Two, this, this is, is, would only happen if every tone had the exact same amount of IQ imbalance, and IQ imbalance is typically frequency selective. So it, it would smear this out, and you would never actually see this. But this is important to understand the phenomenon of what's going on. So I'm going to take the magnitude imbalance away, and I'm going to add phase imbalance. It actually does a similar thing, but also rotates it. Again, you would never actually see these shapes, but, but if you removed all the other factors, you, you would see it there. So, so in, in reality, these would also look like Gaussian noise. So um, what this tells us is essentially every impairment and, and everything about a radio, uh, everything, every issue, uh, amplitude noise, fading, all these things would all look like Gaussian noise in, in, a, in a display like this. And so that's a, the reason why you very often see OFDM systems spec instead of with all these other parameters, they're spec with error vector magnitude, EVM. And that's essentially saying, we don't know we, what all the other factors are that contribute to this, but when you add them all together, they have this EVM. So a minus 30 dB EVM is sometimes, you know, is, is what you might see. And that EVM is sometimes called the SNR, and it's, it's one, one way of measuring SNR. And so, um, now, why is EVM important? Well, you'll, you, the, the better your EVM, the higher the order of your constellation, right? If your EVM is so bad that you have a uh, constellation point this big, you would, you would have trouble with the QAM 16. If you have QAM 64, you, you would need even smaller points. So, right, we can, we can switch this to a, to a QAM 64. Uh, where's our constellation size? Oh, no, I didn't. It's not powers of two. Uh, okay. So this is, actually, this would be QAM 256. Um, but you can see, as you get more and more points, it's more important that, that um, all of the factors that cause uh, impairments are reduced, right? Because a tiny amount of, of, a, of an I offset, or sorry, of a, of a phase balance, can completely ruin your constellation, right? So the, the higher the order, the better the quality needs to be. So an EVM of minus 30 uh, is, is usually considered a, a minimum requirement for, a, let's say, a QAM 64. These days, you're starting to see a QAM 256 used over the air, and there are even some standards that are looking at QAM 1024 over the air, which is used to be, you would think that was even crazy for a cable modem. Uh, but uh, because dynamic range is getting better in integrated chips, at, uh, you're starting to see these higher and higher constellations. And so EVM in every little factor, whether it's IQ balance or phase noise or all these things add up, and so they're all uh, becoming more important. So in any case, that was sort of a, a, a whirlwind tour through, um, through some of these uh, 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 conditions that you'll see on radio signals, how to diagnose them, how to understand them. Uh, you know, the, the full talk, I don't know if it was ever, vi we didn't video it, but I, I gave it at, on another, um, at another venue uh, where it was videotaped. So um, uh, if you're interested, you, can, you should be able to find that online. And the, the 
all the blocks I used to create this are in GNU Radio. And um, if you have any questions, uh, come, come find me. Or, or right now, of course. Also. All right, we have time for a few questions. If there's anybody in the audience that has anything for Matt, and in parallel, would Mike Osmond mind coming up and starting to get set up? So anybody in the audience? Okay. Nope, all right, well thank you very much, Matt.